Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, special stream show start. Um, if it's a little chaotic, then um, I haven't done this in a while. It's like uh, falling off a bicycle. <clears throat> you get hurt whenever you try. So <laughs> there you are. Uh, good to see so many of you uh, have joined me for this evening and for this uh, kickoff. Now, we are going to be, over the next four weeks, designing a campaign basically from scratch. We've already created one thing, and that is the singular idea, the what-if idea. We're going to take that and we're going to expand that tonight whilst we're doing that. So it's only going to be an hour-long stream. We're not going to do these for very long. Um, but that is what we're going to be doing. Now, why are we doing these streams? Well, that's because of this thing here. That's the subscriber number to our YouTube channel. And uh, since we... Um, well, since we're being we're getting very close to that 200,000 subscriber mark, we thought, well, why not celebrate and uh, do a live stream? This is what you guys voted for. We ran a poll. Who wants to see what? And this is what happened. So um, there were a lot of people who voted to see me dancing in a D just dancing um that video you can find if you head on over to dungeon fog uh youtube channel and check out their april fools video so there you go uh for the rest of us mere mortals who don't want to be um traumatized for life well let's get on with our stream so there are a couple of things that i want to get through first and uh, see, uh, uh, just sort of work our way through. So the uh, four uh, video, four weeks that I will be doing these streams for are a prelude to a new series that will be kicking off on uh, Thursday nights. Yes, I know I, I made mistakes on dates and stuff, but nonetheless, on Thursday nights, which you are the first to learn the name of, aside from a small group of friends, and uh, it's simply called How to Be a Great GM Presents training grounds training grounds that's all i'm going to say for now but in the next week or so you're going to start to see information coming out as to what that is i happen to be incredibly excited for it i cannot wait to see how this goes uh, we've got already people that are interested in in this whole thing so i think you're going to enjoy it i think you're going to find it informative i think you're going to find it entertaining i think you're going to learn from it uh, it's exactly what we are it's what we are all about on this channel. And so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I'm also excited um, that, um, well, for some of you that don't know, I got taken off of dairy about a month and a half ago. Those of you who've watched these live streams before know that chocolate milk or banana milk is basically the whole reason for living. So I have uh, not been on any of that because it contains dairy. And uh, today I thought, you know what? First stream, we're celebrating uh, coming together again, which has been quite some time. So let me try something a little different. So I have here, I haven't tried it yet, a glass of chocolate milk that doesn't contain any dairy. It's called chocolate oat milk. And... Um, going to give that a try and just see what happens just see what happens uh during the show just to keep me sane okay so let's move forward let's talk about uh campaign creation now if you haven't seen my video from earlier on this week that launched on monday um i suggest that you're going to have a look at the that at the reasoning behind that and uh to to have an idea of what i'm going to be talking about a re brief brief recap when we are creating campaigns, there are a lot of different ways about trying to generate the idea. And of course, um, I've written that book, How to Create Epic Campaigns. It didn't really touch too much on how to come up with that original idea, that first idea. Um, so we use the premise of what if. And the premise that I postulated in the video on Monday was what if, what if a world existed that was a dumping ground for other worlds. So someone very wittily and uh, technically historically accurately pointed out Australia uh, during the Victorian time period was used as a dumping ground for criminals and things. They sent them as far away as they could. And uh, so um, something similar to that, but different as well. So in my mind, I said, OK, well, what if there was this world where characters were just dumped there? Now, I'm not talking about one of those genre crossovers where you get robots being dumped with aliens being dumped with medieval peasants i'm not talking about that i am very much very much a genre purist personally when it comes to games and things and i like to keep it that way 
But what if there was a space, what if there was a place, a planet, that literally one world went, we are going to dump all of our orc war prisoners there. We're going to dump all of our orc war prisoners. Or we're going to dump our mages. Or we're going to dump this. We're going to dump that. In other words, what if there was a world where we kind of had a survival type thing now survival games are very big currently everyone's trying to play different survival games um things like that um where um you know people are, are, are trying to do do different things and and but primarily survive almost a post-apocalyptic setting if you like as I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this so when we start to look at our campaign idea we have to have to start to analyze it in terms of why would someone want to play in this campaign in the first place what are we offering them well what really is this setting going to be in the first place what is the is the whole idea uh the 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 concept of being dumped onto a planet. Let's unpack that for a little bit. So you are, let's say, an adventurer and, or not even an adventurer, you are a criminal. You are tried by the magistrate, some mage or other, or a judge, and you are deemed to be of no value. So you are exiled to this place. I've given it the name of Arca Valos. I was playing around with various ideas, um, arcane, uh, 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 an asylum, and with asylum came Arkham Asylum, and then Arca Valos, Valos coming from Valor, or trying to recover Valor, or Valiant uh, types of things, um, trying that sort of idea out, so we get Arca Valos, that was how I got to that name, if you're curious, and... Um, I said, okay, all right, so you're a criminal, you get sent to this teleportation gate, and it sends you to this planet, and you fall down onto this planet, which I realize also, now that I'm thinking about it, is the premise for the film Predators, which was the third or fourth Predator film, I forget now, excluding Aliens vs. Predator, uh, and the Aliens vs. Predator 2, then there was Alien, uh, Predators, which is um, the one where uh, the, the guys get dumped on a planet and ammunitions get dropped around them. I actually thought it was quite a nice one with Adrian Brody, uh, Adrian Brody as the lead there. Uh, I actually enjoyed that, that film, to be honest with you. I must watch it again, actually. Nonetheless, so we have these characters that get dropped onto this planet. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's about... It's about trying to decide if that is going to work for us. Now, Plastic Man 01 on Twitch has asked the very, very relevant question. Uh, is this Dungeons & Dragons or something else? So, for the purposes of this particular stream, I think that we will say that it is a fantastic setting and that it could work for Dungeons & Dragons. Um, it could work for Dungeoneer. It could work for, it could work for any fantasy kind of base because... All that we need, our MacGuffin, our our hook, um, is effectively you get dumped on the planet somehow. Um, Erok von Roxalot, absolutely. There was a wonderful film with Ray Liotta and it called No Escape that came out in, I want to say, the early 2000s about a prison planet. Uh, you've also got Kurt Russell did about 20,000 movies in that same time period. Escape from Los Angeles, Escape from New York, Escape, the lesser known one, well, Escape from Vermont. I mean, there were all these different sort of escape froms, get away from penal colonies. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's an idea of, of this, this place, this, this place that characters cannot escape from. So we then sit back and we say, okay, so what are they going to be doing there? Why are they, why are, why are our players going to want to play in that game? What are we offering them? Well, we're offering them the opportunity to survive and to build a colony. I think that's what we're offering them. Because if you look at all of these films, even if you look at the Mad Max films, which is to a large degree, not the first one, but the second and the third one uh, and the fourth one, it's about surviving some kind of collapse of civilization. Because as I was working on the image uh, for the opening um, and, and, and for this, the, 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 the rest of the software that I'm going to be using, 
Um, I had these ideas of these stone portals just hanging in the sky, reminding people that they are aliens that have been put here. And I use the term aliens in terms of, of, of not being local to the planet that have been put here and that those those portals you can't get to or even if you could get to them they only work one way or perhaps not one way i mean that's something that we will have to decide uh, sammy critfiddle points out not uh, potential is there a potential way of escaping well in theory if we are following a traditional narrative one of your campaigns could very well be to escape but I kind of feel like that's a very, very standard um, kind of film, uh, kind of narrative, kind of story, that they will eventually escape. Our hero PCs will find a way. We certainly could do that. Um, we certainly could do that. Now, another great example, the original Aboriginal says it's kind of like Mass Effect Andromeda. Sorry, I can't say that combination of words without dying a little bit inside why i need chocolate milk i need chocolate milk it's not it's not bad so oat milk chocolate milk is not terrible it's not bad i'll say that much okay it's not bad it's not true chocolate milk but then again it's not made out of milk so of course it's not gonna be true. anyway okay sorry back to the back to the point yes mass effect andromeda i think is an excellent example of what we mustn't do and we have the advantage of not having budget chiefs who are saying you're taking too long you're taking this you're taking that we need to uh cut costs cut costs so we're only going to have like three alien species in a whole new galaxy. Whereas in all of the previous film trilogies, we've had dozens and dozens and dozens. Of, anyway, that's not the point. The point is, is that we're making this planet and and we need to populate it with things that are going to make sense. Now, I have been doing something with um, um, Patreons uh, called the Ring World, which is where we're creating a world. So we're not creating a campaign. We're creating an entire world and we're evolving the uh, species and things that are happening there and um, so that's that's kind of what we, we we're trying to to uh, do there we're not going to do that here we're designing a campaign here so we're still unpacking these elements these aspects of it so what are our characters going to do there are they going to be trying to escape or are they going to be um, trying to survive and I kind of feel like the surviving factor is more interesting where they go, you know what? We left that planet and that planet was ruled by an evil person or it was ruled by a good person or it doesn't really matter at the moment. We will come back to it. But I feel like our campaign should be about the players realizing that what they have here is way better than what they had there. I think. I think that's a good idea. So I think that's what we should do. If you can disagree with me, chat is running and I'm reading it. So so disagree with me. I would be I would be happy. Uh, you guys are an excellent sounding board in, 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 in this case. So another question, again, from Sammy Crit Fiddle, which was a good question, is who's running this place and transporting people to it? Well, I think the idea is... There's no one running this place. And I think that's what makes it so interesting for us is that whereas we take something like No Escape with Ray Liotta, there were two camps. There was the insane camp run by one of the greatest villains, I think, of all time. He was absolutely awesome. Um, and then you have the good camp, the people who are just getting on with it and trying to survive. We can have that, but we can push it so much further. I mean, look at 13th Warrior with old Antonio Banderas that I and the first time I watched that film I hated it the second time I watched it I went this is brilliant this is lovely so so we can do that um in terms of of bringing in these elements so we have one group of survivors who are trying to survive we have one group who are raiders and but they're known quantity and then we have other groups these roving bands of man eaters and and things that that are going to be roving through the countryside all of this is great and it's all good for us to think about but we also have to think about again 
why do the players want to be in there? What are they going to do about it? Uh, why are they there? So, uh, Volker Dog, thank you very much uh, for that. I re really appreciate your comments about the camera uh, setup. Um, I do appreciate that. So, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, why? Again, why? Um, another question, Arok von Rockeslot says, would there be a hierarchy of prisoners already there or are we pioneering prisoners? That's an, again, an excellent, excellent, excellent idea. An excellent idea um, is, is that's a good question. Are these the, are the player characters the first ones to arrive or they're already arriving in something? I think they need to arrive in something personally, because again, it is an idea okay, there are, there are things here that we need to ingratiate ourselves with. And I think the idea that there are these different camps is going to be really powerful, allowing our player characters to move between different camps, to work with each other, um, to, to understand how the politics is working. Because again, that gives our players the opportunity of saying, well, go and start your own one or go and work with these ones to defeat those ones or form alliances form groups together it gives us that that opportunity we could draw a book from star trek and take star trek voyager where um, it's a case of the pcs arrive with one piece of knowledge that there is one gate on the planet that has an exit um that's that's something that the PCs could have as knowledge. Or if we really want to make the entire campaign about trying to get out, then there is someone on the planet who knows where an exit is. Something to think about. But again, not so much. So we have to look at our group. We have to decide who our group is going to be in terms of our players. And we need to decide whether it is they are the first ones there and they are discovering and exploring. There was a, a, a very... Um, it was a... A good idea, badly executed show called Terra Nova, which was a bunch of humans that got transported back into the Jurassic Age. And instead of giving us Dinotopia, they gave us, uh, I'm not sure what they gave us, to be honest with you. I think that we saw like three dinosaurs in total, which was very sad. Um, but yeah, so something something along those lines. Um, I think that's... that's um, Terra Nova was getting so much better towards the end, and then they, they got cancelled, of course, so it's too late by then. Um, all right. Assuming that our players are going to want to build up a base, they're going to want to do something. Someone's been man uh, mentioning that there are campaigns out there about building and, and gathering stuff. So something that we need to put in the back of our minds, whatever role-playing system we're going to be using, whether it's Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder or whatever, we will need to add in a module that will allow for the player characters to make stuff. Because whatever role-playing system you're using, it will most likely have like a, a craft skill. Or it might not. Um, as Dead Aussie Gamer, hey Michael, points out, it's Ark, the role-playing game. To a degree, yes. So if it's going to be that the players need to build walls and defensive camps and uh, collect stuff and and et cetera, et cetera, there are systems out there that allow you to simulate that, but they're more focused on that than on the role-playing side of things. I, of course, absolutely love the idea of the players building their own base because it means that they are going to get so absorbed into the space. They're going to want to design stuff. They're going to want to use stuff. Um, they're going to go and try and find stuff that will, will make it work. Now, a lot of people have been throwing out these really cool ideas of uh, ancient civilizations that were here before. Why not? I mean, what we could do is you then start looking at, um, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it yet, um, The Expanse. And you go, hang on a moment, we're using these portals, but no one knows who built them. Someone else built them. And why would they link all of these portals to this planet and then stop using them if they, if the humans or the original powers didn't originally build them? I like that. And I also don't think we need to answer those questions. Not yet, anyway. 
if the player characters start to investigate that, then by all means we can start to develop it. So this is the other thing that I think is very important, is we've got all of these great ideas floating around in our heads, but we need to start to solidify stuff. We need to start locking stuff down. Now, there's some other great questions coming through. Does magic work here? Yes, I feel that magic should work here. And I immediately hear you saying, ah, but then the PCs will fly up to those portals. That's fine. The portals only work one way. So they're not, as, as someone pointed out, they're not really stargates where you can dial a number and get back home. They are one-way drop shoots, which when they open, you can't just push through. That's a great adventure. The players get a, they build a wooden tower uh, 500 feet up into the air, and they've spent adventures trying to get wood and this and that and the next thing. And as they get there, someone falls through, and they touch the, the portal, and nothing happens. They can't go through. So I think that that would be something that would be really, really interesting for them to to, to find out. Um, Formlex says, what if they send a bunch of criminals there just to test if it's habitable? Well, again, that's a great idea. And I think what you would do is, in this case, our character's starting point would be if our players like a challenge, maybe they are pioneers and they're going out first. If our player characters are more, I would say, um, emotionally attuned and like to build into NPCs and things, then I would have them arriving after a few years of this things have, uh, a, a few years after everything has been happening. So there are these colonies that they can start investing into. Because the other thing that we have to bear in mind is what if a player character dies? Where is another player character going to come from? In normal circumstances, it's just a case of roll, roll up a character and um, then off you go. Uh, you just are in the next tavern. There aren't next taverns, which is another great question that we need to look at too, which I think is quite fun. Now, the, the next question, if they are falling out of these portals, how do they survive? How do they survive um, the, the fall? Well, I would say that that's part and parcel of the delivery system and could be the first clue as to what these portals originally were used for. If they fall out of the portal and they land, say, let's say 30 or 40 or 60 feet down, which is not very high, we might need to make it higher, um, then either they take 10d6 damage. No, I don't think we're going to do that or, or whatever your system's damage would be. Maybe as they as they fall out, they land and there is a moment where they float to the ground. So there is definitely a mechanism which, again, would indicate that these portals were not designed as execution points, but very specifically as delivery points. Do you see how important it is for us to start unpacking all these questions? And I love how this whole idea is is is, is a formulating and growing um as 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 we talk about it and that's the important thing i have the benefit of having all of you uh folks contributing but when you're on your own you have the benefit of being able to sit there on your own and work out what's going on so let's say let's say for example that these portals are dumping people there magic works except think about this even if the colonies have been going for a hundred years perhaps perhaps there is no there's no library there's no there are no spell books so player characters that arrive if they're level one or whatever the system is they're going to have the spells that they had and then there's no more so you go well that's unfair why would then anyone ever play a spellcaster and that's a good question why would anyone ever play a spellcaster you have to answer these questions to make sure that that is what is 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 fair so mages are going to have limited access to spells so do you tell your players not to play mages or do you try and add in this ancient technology this ancient uh, not technology but this ancient civilizations where there are crypts that have ancient scrolls on them which do contain magic spells that could be very interesting Especially, especially if, as the players land, for the, the first time they level up, the mage is like, hey, can I get some spells? Nope. You didn't find any spell books. There aren't any spell books to copy from. You are one of the only mages as far as you know. 
okay, where on earth am I going to get this information from? Well, I have heard rumor of a tomb filled with scrolls, but it's guarded, and suddenly you have an adventure. Fighters, yes, SN8015 says don't have any weapons uh, and there's no smith. Well, again, absolutely right. Now, what we do is we lean on games like Ark or um, what's the new one that's just come out? Valheim or Vanaheim. Um, and you go, well, how do you start there? Well, you start with gathering branches and building spears and then ever so slowly you miraculously can start mining iron. Well, how did our ancestors do it? So we start to follow those processes and we start to build those in. We will have to handhold our players. Not a lot of players have survival skills. And wouldn't be able to describe that kind of stuff. And again, I don't think that that is something that we want to really focus on. I think that is something that is flavorful and that will add to it. So I would almost be inclined to say, okay, our first point of order in terms of this whole space. I think given how we are talking about adventures to go and find scrolls, adventures to try and get to these portals, adventures to try and pacify other groups, because we haven't spoken about the locals yet. Some people have been talking about that. They've seen, been saying, okay, well, what about the locals? We haven't been talking about the locals yet. Okay, that's also an interesting question. What about the local people and that sort of thing? So I think we've got enough adventures here, potentially, for at the very least a little maybe five, six, seven, eight, maybe ten adventures. That's a campaign. There's no rule saying a campaign has to be X length, etc., etc. So I think there's definitely something here that's that's interesting. Sorcerers, in in D and D anyway, will have an advantage because uh, and warlocks as well. Can they contact their patrons? What about uh, priests? Hmm. What about priests? Now, I was lucky enough to play in a game uh, with Dead LZ Gamer, as a matter of fact, called Apocalypse Now, which was a very interesting post-apocalyptic game where they had broken down scavenging into currency. So you could scavenge basic parts and it could take an hour and you would scavenge basic parts and then you would, let's say you got five basic parts, you could then make stuff out of these basic parts. Um, you could then uh, scavenge from more complicated stuff. So if you found an old wreck or in our case, if you found an ancient civilized structure, you could uh, take complex parts from that and you could make complex things out of that. And then you would have lists of what is a simple thing and what is a complex thing and what, what components do you need. I thought that was very elegant. So we're going to steal that and use that in our campaign. Why not? It's a brilliant idea. So let's do something along those lines. The player character needs to spend, let's say, an hour. Just one hour. And the, the, the character earns, let's say, five, and we'll figure out names and stuff later on, uh, five um, components. We'll call them components. The five components, you can build an axe or a wagon. No, not a wagon. Uh, but you get my idea. A wall might take 20 components. So what then becomes important, right, if we continue to do this, is you say, right, time is a factor. So a lot of people are saying maybe the gods aren't there. Okay, that's fine. You would have to tell, you would have to tell your players, don't play priests. You won't have a divine connection. Some people are talking about this planet is surrounded by a void. That's really cool. I do like that. Um, Formlex says war warlocks have packs with viruses. Maybe, but we don't really want to change the basic mechanics. If you're going to cut something out of your campaign, you have to let your players know beforehand. We have to do a primer. We will be doing a primer as well. Okay, so time is important for us. If we're going to have our salvage system, our salvage system is important if we want our players to survive. So we know that those are, are integrated with each other. When we talk about the planet itself, our player characters don't have sailing ships to sail all around the world in. They just don't have it. It doesn't exist. So we don't have to worry about designing an entire planet. Even if mages somehow get some kind of teleportation thing, 
is that really going to, to get them over a huge amount of distances? It doesn't matter. It's not going to be relevant to our lives, I don't think. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, Erox says, uh, evil factions would surely set up camps around those portals just for recruitment or food. Of course they would. Absolutely. Evil camps would, would set up around those portals. But I think we could probably have one portal per 100 miles. And those camps, they wouldn't be able to travel 100 miles. And I can tell you why. If we look at our history, we go one of the most well-trained armies in terms of endurance running were the Zulu warriors. And they could run flat out for a day, but they could only cover a distance of about 100 kilometers, which is, what, 50 miles, 60 miles. So a 100-mile radius would put most of those portals out of touch of most people, I think. So, yes, you would have some. And I think the player groups could very easily come across one portal from one planet. Because this is my thinking, is that each portal is linked to a specific planet. So you would know, oh, from that portal, that's where people from planet um, Sudian come from. Just pulling names randomly from, from the chat. Ah, those people generally arrive with spellbooks because they're a very magical-based group of, of individuals. We got to get to them. Except they're surrounded by a camp of pilferers and thieves who use the books as firewood because they don't care about that stuff. They just care about... I think that is... There's another great adventure for us. And that gets me going, aha, I like that. Uh, Roman Wolf 007 says Stargate... Yes, but only one way, only one way. Um, there is there is no no um, no way of getting it back. Uh, original uh, Aboriginal, yes, Planet Braxia. We could have uh, Sajeti elves falling into this portal. Um, I think that could be fun. Uh, Serpents Embrace Two. What exactly is the premise? The premise is a planet that is used as a dumping ground by th hundreds or potentially thousands of other worlds just to dump people in there that they don't want. Uh, so that's that's an idea. Um, more McCheese. Mmm, cheese. I'm going to have some chocolate milk. More McCheese says, What if the portals are from pantheons of other worlds? This world sits in a spot where it's almost a nexus of different realities and the different god pantheons trying to extend their influence into this new realm. They've been fighting for this realm for ages, and the PCs are just new recruits in their efforts. We certainly could go with that route as well, deciding how or why people are brought here. Um, and you go, okay, well, it, it, yes, absolutely, we can certainly do that. Um, we can certainly do that. Um, uh, ancient hungry dragons or creatures from the hells, says Cyril 9847. Yes, this is it. This is what is so interesting. Um, I think, is that uh, the Ottawin portal says Jack of Mines. Correct. We can bring in from wherever we like, which I think is quite a, a quite a, a fun thing to look at. Let's look at the planet for a moment. And I always like to create a map when when talking about the planet. We have spoken about the fact that we don't need people to travel very far in this in this space. So we will need some kind of, of ancient map that we can use um more for referencing ourselves than anything else and i think now more for demarcating territorial control of spaces so if we make a map um i think that is that's going to be our primary focus is 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 working out um the different regions um i did want to show you because a lot of people ask me this question so give me a second here oops wrong button uh hopefully i'm still streaming yep um, I did want to show you some software. I have been promoting it forever because it works beautifully, in my opinion. Um, this is uh, Deos from Dungeon Fog um, Crew. And if we create a new map, this is still an alpha, by the way, folks. So it really is a, a new piece of software, um, which may or may not work. So um, I can zoom out. Uh, there's another update. Uh, no, we don't install it just yet. We're going to use the old version. So what I like about this as a map designing tool is, let's say, we know we don't have to do the whole world, right? We know that. So I'm just going to draw 
uh, a, a space here. Let me, uh, my brush is set at 25, so that's fine. So I'm going to draw out, I'm going to draw out a continent here and say, right, there is my continent. And let's, let's put in another continent that the players can see. We'll put in some waters here so they could cross it in a, a boat of some kind. You know, when you're looking at these kind of, of campaigns where you say um, you are dumped here, the players might say, well, we're going to find a way out. So then as your seed, you say, well, there is a place that I know of that has a portal which supposedly leads off of here, but it is on the other land and you cannot get there. And the players journey to the edge of the coast and they look across and they go, yeah, we're never going to get. Oh, but there is a pass. There is a passage further south through the cannibal territories that will allow us to go. You know, all that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, we could put in a continent up here and say, blah, blah, blah. There's a continent. This is really th the basic kind of, 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 of um, planning. But what I like is let's just put in a little island here. Okay. There's a little island. Now I'm going to zoom in to this place, he said, hopefully. I'm going to zoom into this little space and let's see what our little island looks like. Okay, so here we are. Now we are at a basic sort of scale. So that little island is actually quite big and this continent has suddenly become very large. I'm going to throw down a mountain quickly. Let me just grab a mountain here. Um, and I, I have a point to make with all of this, by the way. Um, so here is a nice mountain. Thank you very much. Let me just put you over there. And I'm going to put down a mountain. Uh, a mountain range. Clink. There we go. So here is a random... Uh, let's just do that. I'm going to grab a whole bunch of mountains and just say, okay, here's our mountain range. This looks awful, by the way, and I wouldn't be... I wouldn't uh, use this particular style, but I just want to prove a point here. This is why I think Deus is going to be really useful for campaign designing in the future. There we go. I've thrown some mountains down. I'm going to zoom in some more so we can actually get to the scale that we would normally be working in. So now you can see uh, the scale that we would normally be, be working at for this, this kind of uh, map, I guess. We would have a mountain range that looks something like this. Um, I'm just going quickly here in terms of, of what I'm doing. Oh, let's not move the continent. Um, so, yes, this is potentially gigantic. Um, and as our players wander around, you look at this and you go, yeah, sure, you have a whole world to explore, buddies. We're still zooming. We're still zooming. Yes. So I'm, I'm not going to advocate that you would ever draw this entire map. You don't need to. Not for what we're doing with this case. We're saying, okay, each square represents, let's say, and I'm talking about these squares. You look at this kind of mountain and you go, okay, I think each square is going to be about five or six miles, give or take, something something like that. Um, maybe even a bit more, I don't know, depending. So we don't need to develop too much. We just need to develop the area that's important. Now, a traditional method would be to have this line of mountains form a natural barrier that our players can't get across. And rumors that on the other side, in a desert or in a whatever we want to do, on the other side, there's a civilization that has magic, they have steel, they have all of the stuff that our players might be wanting. Or well, they might not. I mean, it's just a rumor, right? So again, how do we keep our players engaged? How we keep them hooked is by creating these rather um, dramatic spaces, creating some interesting little valleys here. Now, if you've been listening to my podcasts that I do on a, a weekly basis for my Patreons, um, I've been talking about how civilizations grow and start according to, to some populist theories. Um, the mountain ranges that I'm currently designing here by creating very strong vert, um, uh, horizontal mountains, it uh, is going to create some very interesting problems for, for people, as well as having a strong vertical mountain uh, as well is going to create issues for the players. They don't know it yet, but they are going to suffer from it. Okay, so we would design some kind of map, right? And um, we can we can figure out where it's going from 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 there. Uh, Cyril nine eight four seven is this Azeroth uh, with Kalimdor? No, it's it's not. It's just random drawing. Um, and we we can go in here 
and refine the hell out of it so that it doesn't look anything like uh, what you're talking about. You don't want that, by the way. Uh, if your players sit back and go, oh, this is from Warcraft. No, it's not from Warcraft. This is something that we've made ourselves. Okay. So there you are. Laura Burns in chat. Thank you, Laura Burns. Um, Cyril, I know it's a joke. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay. So we would design our, our world planet and that allows us to then start doing stuff. Now, unfortunately, I haven't made a world planet before the stream started. I didn't think we were going to get this far in the stream, as a matter of fact. So uh, creating out this basic kind of world, what I was uh, talking about is saying, okay, let's start to populate it with our own species. Again, we go back to that question, what or who lives here and why does that make it fun and entertaining? If our players are being dragged away from their fantasy world, which I would say for argument's sake could almost be a stock standard fantasy world, there are some things that we might want to try and avoid. One of the big things for me when we're looking at campaign design is trying to say, well, why aren't we just playing in an established campaign world? I created my world of Braxia many, many, many years ago, decades ago now. Why don't I just go back there? Why bother creating dozens and dozens and dozens of new worlds? Well, I think it's because we can, point number one, but also because it allows us to explore different ideas. So what if in this world that uh, we are, are obviously manufacturing here, our locals are, are maybe more um, in tune with their environment. So I'm thinking possibly something like wood elves. Um, I don't want to, to say that this is going to be Avatar with giant blue creatures running around. I really don't want us to talk about that necessarily. Um, but what can we make or place in this world that's going to make it not feel like a fantasy world? Um, in the traditional sense, because it isn't. It's very rustic. I see some people are talking about druids. Um, that's a, a, not a terrible idea. We could have some civilizations um, that have got iron. Again, if we, if we give technology to a civilization, we have to make sure that we have a very good reason why that civilization isn't trying to take over these uh, individuals. So think about it. If the Roman Empire suddenly had these portals appear and criminals start dropping out of these portals, you can be damn sure they would send a large force to get in there and to start trying to stop that from happening. Um, but if we have more historical druids that are, uh, as uh, the original Aboriginal is saying, um, where they are more about keeping the land, uh, that sort of thing, that could certainly work. They're maybe not going to be so militant. Um, so we can do that which one or which option gives us more adventures it's a it's it's a buzzword that i go back to every single time which one gives us more options and more adventures so i'm going to actually stop doing this map because uh, as pretty as it's already starting to look um it's distracting me as i'm trying to plot out um little valleys so what i'm purposefully doing here is assuming that our players are going to start in this this particular area of the map um, I'm creating these little valleys so each valley like we said each grid is what five miles uh, in 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 distance so by creating a singular mountain spine it cuts off the one the coastal lands to the 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 um, other lands and I'm building in little passes here um, this is still the alpha, by the way. I see there's a question there. Um, what software is this? If you have, head on over to dungeonfog.com uh, and you look for Deos, you'll find that this is the Deos software. It is still in alpha. So there is, there is still a lot of work to be done on this. Um, I'm just using it because I like the idea, uh, particularly for the stream, of showing scale on a real scale. Um, a lot of fantasy maps, you know, you'd have a continent, you'd have one giant mountain range, whereas here we can go all the way out, all the way out, and say, well, yeah, that mountain range that you were designing, it's, 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 insig it's insignificant from a world perspective, but from a player perspective, it's super significant. So what I was talking about, thanks, Laura Burns, is um, creating these little valleys. So valleys are really useful uh, in terms of creating controllable zones, uh, defendable zones. So this valley here that I've just sort of made, uh, we might refine that a bit more, um, open it out a little bit more, make it a bit more of an obvious valley. 
Um, but you've got this valley here, which runs down to the coast, and you've got this little valley here. Let's let's actually make it a bit more obvious there. Um, these valleys, I would start to populate with people. Now, what I also am advocating now, very much on the channel and 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 moving forward, is that okay. So we've got a whole bunch of little valleys. I, I have a spare mountain. Anyone need a mountain? Um, Let's put you in there. I, I can obviously go and select more mountain samples as well because there's only a few here um, drawn by the very talented artist Kaora. Um, but um, okay, so, so 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 we've got some valleys happening and some mountains and and I think that's that's great. We don't need to spend too much more time playing with this. We'll then fill it up with trees and 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 rivers and 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 that sort of thing. Uh, rivers are very important, obviously. Uh, rivers are important because they obviously they allow us to survive uh, to get fresh water something that's very 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 important uh, for human survival so putting in some rivers would be really useful and so I'm just using this old technique to create some rivers we'll put a river there uh, this valley will have a river which flows this way rivers also form natural borders which is great so we'll do a river there and let's have another river coming out of here let's make this like a swampland um, and then we'll do a river there and uh, let's uh, let's have another little river here which joins this one so it becomes bigger um, so we're doing stuff like that okay so um, I think that that starts to give us a sense of our zones and this would be more than enough for us to start playing um, I, I think that something that we tend to do as as world creators and as campaign creators is we try to create too much um too much detail and we get overwhelmed by it so i'm going to create a little forest in here so there's a forest there and let's have some forest here we want forested areas we want plains areas we want a nice mix i would say that this would be possibly the the easy start uh, zone so again um, i'm always talking about taking your players into account if you have players who are survivalists who want to make who actually want to get stuck in and 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 to really play a game um and thoroughly thoroughly get into this whole notion then i would start them in a swamp i would start them in a difficult area and why are swamps difficult fire fire is impossible in a swamp well, it's not impossible but it's very difficult in a swamp so you could put in fire now there are obviously certain classes that are going to excel if we're talking dungeons and dragons rangers druids that sort of thing uh, will excel because they naturally have survival crafts and and can track and survive in in the wilderness and and, and that kind of stuff so yes there is definitely that i'm not saying that that isn't going to be a factor again i think our crafting system where you spend an hour foraging regardless of your class i know someone suggested that um maybe your class determined what you could find so wizards would be more inclined to find bark or papyri or something along those lines whereas fighters might find more uh, hardy woods or plants or be able to carry more i mean we can we can go into that um that is that to me is the finessing that we would have um in terms of of that um you know oh, majors could find minerals yeah absolutely absolutely i mean you could do whatever you like if your players are not diehard survivalists then i wouldn't start them in a swamp i would start them in a more neutral environment where they have a chance of surviving or within a good camp perhaps for example or near a camp of, of good good people i think the other thing to bear in mind as well of course is um once your players have kind of landed they need to have some goals and they might not necessarily have those goals straight off the bat you might need to give them goals um again it depends on your players and, and, and how accustomed they are to surviving uh, to surviving to survival style uh play and i i also would make damn sure that my first few adventures the first one would be survive so they drop out into this place um you know we we want to establish that there are good people and there are bad people so when we look at our rule 
um, our rules for narrative say that we need to introduce our players to our baddies. Now, I don't think that we need to have a single big bad. I don't think this needs to be an epic campaign. I think this needs to be a player-based campaign um, or at the very least episodic. So by episodic, I mean it's one, 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 one. Uh, the adventures are not linked to each other. It's just one adventure after another. This lends itself to that perfectly. By player-based, it means taking our players' backstories and working them through here. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to say, oh, there's a letter from your mother. Maybe she threw it through the portal and that got carried from person to person until it eventually found the player character. That would be mind-blowingly amazing from a difficulty perspective, and it would certainly put a lot of weight onto that adventure. Um, would it be the right thing to do? Well, once, yes, but not, not for, for, for many more things. So I think building up a player character type of situation, uh, type of, of, of campaign with an episodic nature would be really strong here. You could have a big bad and the big bad could be the people who threw them here. Absolutely. You know, you can definitely go along those lines, I think. Um, but I, I kind of feel episodic here would work really, really well. Um, I see a couple of people are commenting on the uh, Lorica Segmentata. That's the Roman armor that is behind me. Um, yes, that uh, I used to wear in the shows. Um, nice little replica uh, armor there. Um, so, yeah, we can we can certainly do that now. Um, OK. Where was I? Uh, right, we're nearly at the end of the stream for tonight. We don't, I'm only doing an hour. I know I should do more, but I'm only doing an hour. Um, so we have our map. Now it's just a case of deciding who's going to go where. We need to start talking about the creatures that are going to be living here. I know we sort of said maybe druids. We said something along those lines. I kind of feel that... that um, the, the races that are on the planet. If you think about it, if this planet has been used for a long time, um, let's just zoom in here. Wait, how close can we go? Okay, we can, oh, not that button. <laughs> Suddenly forest because the GM scrolled right. Um, yeah, so that's full magnification, by the way. So we can we can get some, some pretty, pretty finesse detailing in there. Um, and, and, and if you look at that and you go, okay, now each block is a mile. Um, that's a lot of, of space that we've got to play. That is a lot of space that we've got to play in. Okay. All right. So let's forget about the, 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 the map for now. I will export it later. The races that we're going to have on this planet, I feel like they could be amalgams. So we're going to start giving our players clues, right? And if it's been going for a while... I would say that the, the, the dominant species that lives in the area that the players start in anyway, it would be really cool if they were like a hybrid. So they are standing about five foot tall. They're very muscular. They're slightly green with elf pointed ears. They are in tune with nature, but maybe they have quite ornate beards. So in other words, it's a human who coupled with an orc, who coupled that progeny, then coupled with elves or dwarves or gnomes. And so you start to get this, this, this ball of race all combined into one. And... I think that could be a nice way of saying this planet has been going for a long time and people have been forced to cohabit and forget all of the animosity of the past. Forget all of the, that sort of stuff. We are now all working together. And that I love subverting those expectations. So when they come across this, this kind of orcish thing, they're not sure what it is. My father father's father was an orc my father's mother's mother was a, a, a an elf or this or that i think that could that could be quite a nice testimony to say that this has been going on for a long time i would be against or not against i would have perhaps certain groups that have decided to stick together so an elvish group that has broken away and lives in the mountains and hoards all of their knowledge 
a map of the region, that sort of thing. Again, a lovely, a lovely, lovely opportunity, I think, for an adventure. And the player characters discovering, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the elves have got a map of the region, and that will show you where one of the portals is. Could be something along those lines. I wouldn't have major cities. I would have smaller cities. I, or not even cities. I would have little hamlets, little villages with walls around them. Definitely, definitely, definitely... Um, I'm thinking perhaps the Norman era where you've got a Mott and Bailey and about that's about it. I don't think anything further. Or where you have individuals that have taken over ruins from previous civilizations and they've fortified those ruins. I think that would be a great thing. So I think in our next stream, uh, which will be next week, Wednesday, same time, same channels, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at now developing the ideas towards the space because that's all we need to do and then we're basically nearly there to start playing we know what we've got i think it's really exciting um where where we are at the moment um i think in terms of the animals i see sn8015 says yeah what about animals uh, i see lots of votes for cobbles we'll include cobbles don't worry we'll include cobbles somehow i think that definitely will be brought in um without a doubt uh, so yes, we will look at that. Um, uh, Gwelwin, the antagonistic force. Oh, there are going to be, there are lots of antagonistic forces. And that's something that we're going to have to look at as well uh, in terms of this campaign is this sort of survival thing, this this idea of, of how do our characters survive um, and uh, uh, make a, a, a success of it. All in all, I think as a campaign, I don't see this as being something that's going to run on for years and years and years unless we really want to to develop the cultures and the PCs have some kind of major impact. I think if the PCs have the ability to to forge a kingdom, that would be that would be amazing. But again, I feel like that that's a little bit too too um too advanced for what we're trying to do here. Um, I think I think that's too big a campaign. And we don't have to worry about that. We're not planning on that. We remember our goal is 10 sessions, uh, 10 adventures, I should say, not 10 sessions, 10 adventures in this space. So I think we've got a pretty good start. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in and for watching. Um, I believe that there are some streams happening from some other wonderful folks which uh, we need to to show some love on. I don't have Twitch open. Um, I think we've got... Give me a second here. We'll raid. Uh, it's either Dungeon Fog or World Anvil. Um, let's see who, who, who we can show some love to. Um, I have to make this full screen. I can't see what's going on here. Give me a second. I really thank you all for showing up. I didn't expect to see so many people here since we haven't done a stream like this in the past uh, few months. So I really appreciate that. Like I said, 6th of May is when Training Grounds begins. More information you can find. Um, if I use proper English, you could find more information, I should say, uh, on our Discord channel that will be coming up. I don't see World Anvil online. I don't see uh, Dungeon Fog online either. So uh, there is that, um, sadly. Um, anyone wants to make a suggestion, I'm happy to, to send a few people there. Otherwise, all of you guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again next week. And uh, until then, uh, I wish you all the very happiest of gaming. Oh.